Hello, and welcome to Spotlights. This is the podcast for the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology. As usual, I'm your host, Sam Mickey. And not as usual, we're not going to have uh, the usual format of interviewing a guest for this episode. Instead, since we have a little over 40 episodes already under our belt, uh, I figured now would be a good time to dig back in our archive and pull out a few clips from a few different episodes that uh, draw on similar themes. So the theme for this episode is going to be all about environmental learning and education, including some, some history as well as some practices. So I have clips from a few different episodes that we've had, uh, one from Mitchell Tomashow talking about his book, To Know the World, A New Vision for Environmental Learning. And he gives a nice history of the very idea of environmental learning and how that's developed over recent decades. And then uh, I also have uh, Jason Brown from Simon Fraser University talking about his practices for teaching about trees in relationship to the humanities. So a good example of some practices for teaching environmental humanities, including some practices for how to teach environmental humanities online, since uh, so much of this last year and a half has involved teachers figuring out how to move uh, curriculum online during the pandemic. So uh, following Jason, we have a clip from Kimberly Carfor from University of San Francisco, and she'll be also sharing uh, some tips, some tactics, uh, some practices for teaching nature immersion, um, including uh, practices for on the ground face to face work, as well as some ways to, to even include nature immersion, you know, nature awareness practices in online environments. So I hope you enjoy the show. And if you like uh, any one of these particular uh, clips, maybe go back and check out the full episode. If you've already seen the full episodes, hopefully this kind of remix of the clips helps you see it in a new light and brings up some new ideas and thoughts for you. So I'll let Mitch take it away. I, I feel that environmental education has been trivialized over the years. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that. I don't, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's induced by environmental educators, but you hear the word environmental education and often you just, you just think of, um, of innocent natural history right. or innocent or innocent recycling. <laughs> right. uh, let, let's, that's not the case for lots of environmental education. It can get very deep, but often it is trivialized. So I wanted to use a different term. Nice. And the term learning, I think, expands how we think about human nature relationships um, because it's, it's constantly happening. You're constantly learning about the natural world. It's a process. Um, and so that's part of why I did it. Um, and also just to raise the question so people could, could think about it. You know, what is the difference between these words? And um, w why, should, why should we use the word environmental learning when everyone already thinks of it as environmental education? Right. So that, it's really that. I wanted to up the stakes a bit. Nice. Yeah, because otherwise it's easy for environmental education to just be kind of adding the environment into education and stirring, whereas what you're doing is really rethinking the very idea of education from these kind of environmental ecological perspectives. Um, you said it way better than I did. <laughs> so, uh, so the new book, what's going on? To Know the World, A New Vision for Environmental Learning. Uh, I've been thinking about this field really for my entire career and really for my entire life. Uh, I, you know, there's a, a whole bunch of us. When I went to college at New York University in the late 1960s, and I am a child of the interdisciplinary 60s, there wasn't a single environmental course in the, on the entire campus of a major private university in New York City. Wow. So, um, I remember way back then, we used to go down to the, I used to go down to the Cafe Agogo and see all the new bands coming from the West Coast and from England. I was in my late teens at the time. Uh, and I go to the A Street Bookstore and one day I saw the Whole Earth Catalog on the shelf. And for those who don't know that book, it was, it was a curriculum of the world. Uh, it had sections like, it had sections on natural history and communication and learning and tools. I love that book. I, I just, I picked it up and went back to the, my dorm room, my apartment, and um, I, I just immersed myself in it and read a lot of the books that were in there as well. And I realized that there's, there's a whole new way of thinking about 
what I could study and how I could live. Mm. Um, but there wasn't, there really weren't academic programs set up for it. You know, we had, we had forestry schools, like the Yale School of Forestry, and we had ecology programs, but nothing that looked at all the different aspects of what it means to live on this planet from a humanities perspective, from a social perspective, from a political perspective, and of course, from a spiritual perspective. So most of my career, and many people in my age group, I'm 70 now, uh, built the field. You know, I think of folks like David Oren and, and many, many others, many of my colleagues at Antioch over the years, we provided a place for folks to study what we always would have liked to have studied ourselves. And so we built all these programs. And so you, you go into the future, it's 1970, you know, at the time, and you move 40 years into the future and you've got this field of environmental studies that just about every university in North America and many around the world have these programs. And then sustainability programs emerged as well, which came, you know, very, very important aspect of how we think about environmental learning. But it, it occurred to me as I started writing this book that to some extent, environmental studies, even though its message really hasn't been internalized by the general public, but as an academic field, it was a victim of its own success. Hmm. And I didn't feel like it was making enough strides to reflect what the world is like now all these years later. Right. So, you know, the first challenge and I write about it in a chapter called The Tides of Change, is that we've got, and it goes, it takes us back to the 60s as well, because one of the things that was so fascinating about the 60s was we have the convergence of all of these movements. You have the civil rights movement, um, the women's movement, the peace movement, the environmental movement. And I realized that we're, we're going through a similar series of challenges in our era. And here they are in brief, there are four of them. One is, how do we think about human nature relations, which has always been at the source of, of uh, environmental questions. Mm -hmm. But the other three are, one has to do with what tribes, tribalism and, and race. Uh, how do we deal with this very challenging question? Yeah. Another has to do with equity, of course, mm -hmm. and how we distribute wealth, who gets what and why. And the third has to do with how we make decisions, and that's the issue of inclusion. It's, you know, it's often described as that, but it's really the issue of democracy. Mm. So we have these three issues. We have tribe and race, we have, we have equity and, and distribution, and we have decision-making, inclusion, and democracy, all linked back to human nature relationships. So the challenge, I think, for the field and I'm not by any means the first to say this, there have been a lot of people who've talked about this over the last couple of decades, especially the environmental justice pioneers. The challenge is, how do we bring all of these things together? You can't study human nature relationships without looking at the other three issues. You right. just can't do it. And if you're looking at the other three issues, but not including human nature relationships or environmental questions, then you're not doing it the right way in my view. All right, thanks so much to Mitchell Tomashow. And now we're going to go ahead and pass it over to Jason Brown to tell us a little bit about trees and the humanities. So I always wanted to teach a class on, on trees and forests and the humanities. And I've been so, you know, blessed by SFU. They basically said, here's a section. What would you like to teach? And I said, how about a class on trees and forests and the humanities? And they said, okay. Not bad. <laughs> so, I feel very lucky and I put together a, 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 a syllabus and I feel like there's just a wealth of material that's coming out of this, um, out of this class, so. Yeah, and are you teaching uh, people who are majoring in something that would be relevant to that, like environmental studies majors, or are these mostly people for whom you're introducing this topic, this kind of weird intersection of trees and humanities? It's basically for, um, I'm, you know, it's basically for the general student body who need a upper division humanities course uh, to graduate. <laughs> nice. And they end up so getting I've an got, environmental humanities. I've got people in there who are in business, engineering, you know, life sciences, uh, a couple of um, resource management folks who've taken my environmental ethics class, a couple of students who've taken my intro to religious studies class. 
you know, it's um, so it's a totally mixed bag and we're all kind of learning together, you know, like, nice. you know, like I don't have I don't have classical training in, you know, let's say mythology, for example. Right. So I'm in a lot of ways I'm coming to some of this material for the first or second time. Uh, and so it's really been a great exploration for me as a scholar to round out my understanding of the humanities. Um, but some of these folks haven't even thought about the trees in their backyard, you know. Right. So, so one of the assignments is a is a arboreality journal. So they have to do a reading response, but they also have to sort of engage uh, this journal theme, which one of them is to sort of okay, what what are the five closest trees to the place that you sleep? Hmm. You know, and 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 students, some of them are like, oh, I don't think there's any trees near me. <laughs> they realize you know that how how proximate trees are yep. or that you know the woody perennials are are in our coffee are you know providing right. our food they're in our houses you know so that's been a big wake-up call for that's a, that's great yeah. i'm gonna have to steal that assignment that's a good oh, one yeah, i'll send you the syllabus but the the journal theme i find a really good pedagogical tool i use it in my religion and ecology class and so it carried over into this. So it's like, yes, you need to respond to the main themes of the reading, but here's this thing that will take that reading outside, you know, yeah. and you have to sort of go out and sit for 30 minutes without your phone, or you have <laughs> to go on a small pilgrimage, or you have to write a ecological rule of life, or you have to climb a tree, you know, like ah, nice. these themes that you have to do uh, that sort of take the readings outside. That's great. And the, it seems doable in the context of the pandemic as well, because like a lot of the kind of nature immersion, outdoor education stuff we would do, it would normally be groups getting together. Yeah. It sounds like in this case, they can kind of go on their own time in their own yard. Yeah. And uh, so you can still socially distance and, and learn about trees. Yeah, it works. It works in both settings really well. Um, so I think that this summer, they're going to have the resource folks are going to have me teach the forest ecosystem management course ah. and it'll be all online. So they're going to have the exact same sort of thing. It'll be more like, you know, um, go out on your own and then report back to your small group and then report nice. back to the, to the class sort of a thing. Nice. I like that a lot. Yeah. It's yeah. such a challenge teaching, uh, anything environmental through, through zoom. I've heard students, you're talking about what it's like doing dissections. You know, they're like, basically, they just videotape the dissection in the lab, then they make us watch the video as if we're doing it. And then we are supposed to write a lab report. And it's all this very kind of disconnected, discombobulated thing. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any other uh, tips or tricks or strategies for folks who are um, trying to teach humanities or environmental work or both uh, online right now. Well, I use a standing desk right now. I'm sitting, oh. but I find that teaching standing up is really it really helps with the energy of the oh. class. You know, I, I teach standing up. Um, I limit any any online any synchronous portion to to two hours max. Hmm. Uh, in my intro to religious studies course, I recorded the lectures, uh, so they watch those asynchronously, and I converted all of the lectures into mp3s so that huh? so that students can then I, I encourage them actually i say okay if you've had enough screen time take this outside listen to the mp3 outside go on a walk um, i've also included a lot more mp3s and youtube videos in my mm -hmm. curriculum mm -hmm. instead of long articles because there's enough screen time as it is so yeah. really giving students an, an option to to engage the material outside somehow but then, as you know, as I said, um, I assign uh, journals that actually require them to go outside right. and they have to reflect, write about it. So it has kind of the dual uh, purpose of engaging the material in a different way, getting them outside, um, but also kind of secretly and subtly and maybe not so subtly um, encouraging them to do self-reflective work so that the class becomes an opportunity for transformational learning rather than just, you know, concept and, and lineage memorization, which a lot of classes or in a lot of scholars kind of default to, because it's like, 
I'm a knowledge keeper, and so you need to know the lineage of this of this um, of this discipline, and you need to know the major pa- papers and the controversies, you know, and and yeah, they're yeah. and we're knowledge keepers, and we feel like we need to, you know, uh, dispense that. But I find, that especially in undergraduate education, you know, it's not till it's not till graduate school that you really need to become familiar with the canon. Or the, yeah, or yeah. the like, you know, the, and so, so to me, it's like, well, let's just engage with the themes in ways that go beyond the boring essays. Let's engage with YouTube videos. Let's engage with MP3s uh, and, and reflective writing. And obviously I sneak in lots of uh, meaty, meaty essays, right? They have to respond to those, but I, I entice them with these other uh, multi mixed media kinds of approaches. And then and then when we get to class, uh, I make it a point to really check in with each student, like mm-hmm. really sort of, you know, like, how are you kind of face to face sort of thing? And, you know, you don't have time to do that with 50 students, uh, you know, directly, but but I find ways to really make sure they know that they're that I know they're there, you know, that I know that they can be um, that it's not just a name on a screen. You know, and in 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 person classes, I do that by memorizing everyone's names. You know, mm-hmm. and making making kind of a, a pedagogical activity of it, of of making sure I memorize everybody's names. But then on Zoom, their names are right there, so <laughs> right. it's like it's it's uh, you have to find other ways. And so I do that by small groups, right? I I divide people into small groups, and then we come back into the bigger group. Um, and they've they've looked at the reading in some cases they've watched the lecture and so the synchronous time can be much shorter so they don't have they don't feel like they're three hours on on zoom for the class or even four hours in some cases so for me it's it's two hours is the maximum that i'll do synchronously and then assign people other things outside of that that's awesome those are a lot of good good things, even just the idea of standing up. I know that was a tough thing for me because I like to stand when I teach. Yeah, yeah, and sure. then when I sit and then so the lecture is just very slow and boring. It's just, hi, everybody, we're going to talk about stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I like that. And G- memorizing people's names is always a tough one for me. Once you get over like, once it's more than like 25 people in the class, I'm yeah. like, oh, this is, yeah. this is a challenge. No, but I, I do it up to, I've done it up to, um, up to 50. That's great. In, in one class. But then, you know, as soon as the class is over, I'm just completely useless. It just, it just <laughs> leaves, leaves the brain. But, but there's a lot of mnemonic devices when they're sitting in front of you, right? Like, and they, and they continually sit there. That, that really helps. Right. So. It's like, everybody stay where you're sitting. Exactly. <laughs> Wherever you sat last time, sit there again this time. <laughs> and you know, honestly, even if it, even if it takes you two thirds of the class, I find that students really appreciate the effort. You know, mm-hmm. they really do. That's true, right? That's a big part of uh, the college experience. It's not just about getting information in your head. It's about a certain level of recognition and community. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah, feeling like I've seen that the, the professor cares about me. It's not just like ah, these students here right. to worship at my feet. Yeah, uh, I yeah. really try to avoid sounding like I know everything about the discipline because I don't, and which isn't so it's not hard. But, um, but really making sure that they know that they're seen and that they're welcomed and that their 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 intrinsic value is not caught up in their final grades. You know, I really make sure that that's clear. Yeah, because yeah. there's just so much stress and anxiety and and sometimes personal grief and you know stress at home and you know so it's it's a it's a learning community that's what i try to say every every semester that this is our learning community and i and then i always repeat that that really stupid um cliche of don't let don't let um university get in the way of your education you know like use this material to explore things that you're interested in you know and that that spark your attention and so, and in, in, you know, integrate habits into your learning that will last beyond the degree sort of an idea. All right, thanks to Jason Brown. Now we're gonna go ahead and pass it over to Kimberly Carfor, who's likewise gonna share some tips and practices for teaching nature awareness or nature immersion. 
So I'll pass it over to Kim. I really like, um, there's this one that I like to do called Shinrin Yoku. And um, I think technically that means forest bathing. Um, but the person that I adopted it, this practice from is just means um, engaging nature in all of your senses. And so, you know, it'll be a meditation where you just open your eyes, you know, sight, you'll look around and absorb nature just using your sight and then sound. So then you'll focus in on the sound, smell, um, touch, and then taste. So like, you know, you can put soil in your mouth or something like that. So that's like a meditation that I like to use. Another meditation I like to use is called going feral. And so it's about tapping into your ecological self, um, trying to shut down the egoic the the rational mind the ego tapping into one's emotions and intuitions and using that as a way into tapping into the natural world communication that's going on in the natural world all the time um, so that's why meditation really is a good tool for nature awareness is because it's um, opening up to your multiple ways of knowing um, so those are some of the meditation some of the actual practical practices that I like to use um, is the sit spot. I know a lot of people who teach outdoor education um, adopt a, a sit spot. And so basically a sit spot can be anywhere, you know, out your front porch, your backyard, your local park. Um, but the main goal of having a sit spot is to get to know your non-human neighbors and the regularity is really important. And so it's a place that you go back to all the time um, because you want to see you want to get to know, you know, the, the native plant species. You want to start to differentiate between um, local bird species and migratory bird species. And so that's why you have to go to the same place over and over again. So I have them, you know, do uh, bird identification practices to start learning these species. Um, and so I have them use apps. Um, there's a bird app where you can learn to identify birds based upon uh, what they look like and their sound. And then I also use an app called iNaturalist where um, you uh, can take a picture of a plant and then uh, identify that plant and then learn about, you know, uh, that, that, that plant species. And then um, another one of my absolute favorites is um, bird language. And so I have adopted this from John Young. And he, um, I mean, I could go into it or <laughs> I'm not sure if we have time, but uh, well, I mean, I'd be curious a little bit uh, what the short because I get the identifying the bird species. What would it mean to like identify the bird's language, like learning like what its chirps mean and right? Yeah, so so the main thing of bird language is identifying their five basic um, types of speech, mm -hmm. and so you know one example is an alarm. And so, you know, one is song where you can, you can identify song. That one's pretty easy. Um, but then the alarm is actually when they're just really high pitched staccato noises like doot, doot, doot. Um, and so you'll just learn um, that that's how they communicate to one another um, that when they're speaking an alarm that maybe there's like a, an occipiter or, you know, a cat around and they're warning their other friends. Um, that there's a uh, danger around. There's also something called a shapes of alarm. And so this is a cool um, way to think about non-human communication in general, right? Because humans often think of communication as vocal. Um, but when you're learning about communication, also known as like biosemiotics, um, when you're learning about communication in the natural world, oftentimes it's, it's opening up to patterns and pattern identification and instead of just listening. So a shape of alarm is, so say a bird is, you know, there's a predator around, say there's like a cougar. And then if you are looking in the trees and you see many birds that will do this popcorn, go from like this level to this level, um, you can identify that there is a predator that is probably on the ground, um, because the, you know, the law of the wild is that it takes calories um, to, to use calories. And so when you want to use as few calories as possible. Um, and so the reason that they pop corn into the middle is because that's just far away 
um, from where the cat can jump up and get them. Um, and so, but if it's like a, a bird, like an occipiter, an occipiter is like a hawk or an owl, um, then it might, you'll see the birds just like kind of scattershot that way. So then that's, if you see the bird scattershot that way, you might think, oh, even though I don't see an owl, I can tell that there's probably an owl around because they're behaving in a certain way. So kind of mm. opening up to these different shapes. Interesting. So yeah, you'd know, oh, that couldn't be a cat or something attacking from the ground. That's not because they wouldn't waste the energy. They wouldn't waste the energy. Yeah, exactly. that's very interesting. I like the idea of uh, seeing language. Yeah, because I guess I mean, I think everybody gets this with like, a cat or a dog, you can tell so much by the way they're wagging their tail. Yeah, right? because you, you see happy, the agitated. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, that's a good one. And more something I could I could see uh, doing aside, you know, because fire making sounds complicated. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm curious, complicated. You, you mentioned uh, who you're getting some of the ideas of bird language from. Who was this again? Yeah, so um, John Young uh, has a book called What the Robin Knows. And so he covers all of this. That's a great resource if you're interested in, in learning about bird language. He also has a website with a bunch of um, you know, bird sounds, if you want to really dive into learning bird language, he's got a whole wealth of resource. So yeah, oh, nice. he's the guy to go to. He's the bird language guy. Yeah. And yeah. he adopted his practices from a lineage, um, starting with an, an Apache elder stalking wolf. So. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Um, well, geez, I really appreciate this. You know, we had uh, Jason Brown on, uh, on the podcast, uh, a about a week ago and uh he was talking about similar kinds of things he's you know doing like assignments where students would journal about the oh, yeah. trees that are around and so it's like you don't have to go to you know a national park there's yeah. going to be trees just around your house or even just the trees that are in the things that we use like wood in your house and you know so i appreciate all these ways that people are finding to uh bring nature into our lives even when we're teaching online. Yeah, um, absolutely. I I like hearing that he did that um, because I had a exercise last semester, which I'll probably also do this semester. Um, it's just basically commune with a tree. And so step by step, just tell them how to, and it's basically tap into your intuition, try to get out of your mind, quiet the mind. Um, and I had a student who, uh, and she described to me how just even finding the tree was a very intuitive experience for her. You know, which is the tree that's talking to me? Which tree wants me to sit down next to it? You know, rather than just me thinking um, in that sort of dominator um, attitude, right? Which one do I want to? Um, and so, yeah, it was a very emotional experience for her, she, she described. Mm, that's a good one. Yeah, I think trees and birds are things that are easy to, to forget are right around us. Yeah, it's absolutely. Kind of like once you you know open your mind to that possibility, then the, the things start to call out to us a little bit more. Absolutely, and that's kind of like what a lot of my work is surrounded, um, tuning into the voice of the wild. Right, um, it's 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 always there. You know, it's just learning to tap into it. Wonderful. Okay. Well, I hope you uh, liked each of these clips. Hope they helped bring a new perspective to environmental education or environmental learning, as Mitch Thomasho likes to refer to it. So uh, we will be back next week with some more content for you. In the meantime, take care and be well.